<laughs> oh, uh, like to be uh, chatting with you is just kind of surreal. No way. You're the guy. You're the man of the hour here. You you made all the rounds here on the on the networks lately. You probably uh, have been through this enough now that you've got your story. Say hi, Pete. Hello. <laughs> There's Pete. Hello. Um, that you've probably got your story down pretty good by now, I bet, huh? Yeah, I just sent you a text. So um, Darren, I guess, had decided to talk finally. Yeah, I just saw that. It looks like uh, Savannah Guthrie got the scoop, it looks like. Yeah, so that'll be great to hear his side. Yeah, yeah. But we'll get the we'll get the better side from you, the real technical yeah. stuff of what well, happened. So here he is, the man of the hour, Robert Morgan, Captain Morgan himself, the guy who helped talk the... Uh, pilot of the airplane or the passenger of the airplane that had to fly the Cessna 206 solo for the first time uh, in Florida to a successful landing. And it was Robert that did the actual instruction via a radio to talk him down. So glad to see you. Thanks for reaching out. And you say you, you've, you've uh, been watching the channel in the past. Oh yeah. Um, you do a really good job with all the accident stuff. Um, and then I start finding myself watching ones that aren't aviation, like it just anything you put on, but it, it's just very detailed. And, you know, um, you, you start to learn even more and you're like, Hey, that could happen to me. That's right. Or yeah, yeah. Yep. Could happen to any of us. So tons of questions on all of this, um, uh, because you're going to back, be able to backfill the whole side of the story. We couldn't tell because of the lack of ATC audio tape, among other things. First off, what happened to the original pilot that was flying the airplane? Um, so all I really know is that he told the one of the passengers, or maybe both, that he had a headache. And shortly after that, I don't know how much longer after that, he just basically went unconscious or passed out. And I don't, I'm not sure if he like fell forward into controls, but obviously something pretty bad happened, judging the ADSB data to lose so much altitude so quick. But how was he after the aircraft landed? Oh, so um, so when the aircraft landed, um, I wasn't there once again, but I was told he was unconscious still. He was brought to the hospital and um, basically had a heart issue. Mm, okay. So um, they did some kind of surgery and they were able to basically wake him up after the surgery. Um, probably about, I think they tried like a several hours after to get him up and he didn't get up right away. And then they waited like six more hours and were able to actually get him up. And from the stories that I heard, he was actually um, said he remembered some of the stuff that was going on when uh, I guess either right before it happened or maybe like kind of as he was kind of like in and out of consciousness. But uh, uh, long story short, I believe he's still in the hospital, but they're expecting him to recover, long road to recovery. But um, it's looking good where normally it doesn't look so good for what the condition he had. But it was definitely heart related. Um, what do you know about the other passengers on the airplane? Who, who um, so there? there, so there's two passengers and, um, the pilot, from what I understand, the other passenger is, is doing okay. Um, I, I know he was friends with the pilot. Um, and then Darren, the guy, the other passenger who landed the plane is friends with the owner of the plane. And that's pretty much to my extent, all I know, I, I kind of wanted to get more to the story from Darren that who landed it. Mm -hmm. um, because he came over to our air traffic control facility about an hour and a half later or so and met us mm -hmm. on that time the pictures and stuff. But, uh, you know, I felt like somebody going through that, you just survived that ordeal. It didn't want to be bothered with a bunch of questions. I just asked a couple like, Hey, like, like how, how, what happened to the pilot? Like how mm -hmm. did he like, f you know, just pass out and enter the controls and you guys had to rush up just really short questions. And I just asked him, did, did he want to get his pilot license now? And he said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I, the whole time I was thinking that maybe when that happened, you know, they regained control of the plane and they pulled the pilot back and um, Darren was flying from the left. But now the more I think about it, Darren might have been sitting in the co-pilot seat the whole time or or the friend was one, one way or the other. I feel like if something like that happened that bad, um, I don't know if they would have been able to run up to the front with it if they were both sitting in the back. 
Yeah, so, it would seem I, to me if it's just the two of them and a pilot that one of them would already be sitting in that right front seat. Yeah, and then um, since since the other passenger was a friend of the pilot, I would think maybe he would have wanted to sit co-pilot, but but I'm not sure, and and I, I have a feeling that Darren might have landed the plane from the right side, and the pilot was maybe just kind of like you know strapped down so he didn't fall into the controls again. But that's all that's all speculation. I don't, we don't know any... yet. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Yet. But but Darren will be telling his story soon. And yeah, I really those hope of you that are uh, that are unfamiliar. The Cessna Caravan, of course, has a dual set of controls on on both sides, so you can fly and land the aircraft and even apply the brakes from either the left or the right seat. So, um, based on all this, he, his landing was so good, a lot of people are questioning, are you sure this guy hasn't flown before? After having met him and he's, and he's saying, I don't want to be a pilot, are you pretty well convinced he really, truly never has flown before? So, so I did ask him, um, you know, I asked him, hey, do you have a ride home? And he said, uh, well, I'm, I, I rented a car and I'm going to drive back to Lakeland. I said, oh, wow. I said, uh, I have some family in Lakeland. I said, do you ever go to Sun and Fun? And he said, I, I've set up stuff there before because, you know, I have a like a commercial flooring type of company or something mm -hmm. and just left it at that. But he said, I've been around aviation. I've been in the cockpit a lot. And his actual, his friend, from what he told me, his friend owns that caravan. So I just assume like, you know, maybe he's just, in small planes a lot and he had made a um comment to like i've seen them do i've seen them watch them a lot but i'm not a pilot hmm. okay. so i don't know how many times he's actually been hands on the controls or not maybe just for fun or something but and, and the pilot of course is now known he's uh dar da darren darren harrison and Yes, correct. Darren Harrison, age 39, and he's the vice president of that uh, uh, flooring and window blind company. Yeah, somebody called it interior design, but I don't know what the official. Mm -hmm. he, he's pretty, he seemed to be pretty private. I, I had um, texted him the next day just after this happened just to make sure he got home okay. Good. Um, and I said, man, I, I'm so glad. I mean, I was ecstatic that, you know, they were okay. And uh, I just said, I owe you a cold beer if I'm ever passing through. <laughs> Okay, so there you were uh, sitting, having, enjoying lunch and reading a book, and you are the air traffic controller at the Fort Pierce Control Tower. Is that correct? No, so um, so I work at Palm Beach Air Traffic Control Facility. So I am a uh, tower and tracon level nine. Um, the the guy that the news is playing a lot that audio. That is um, another guy that works at the Fort Pierce Tower, and he's been in some interviews too. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you see him, he's kind of got a, a darker beard, a okay. little bit younger than me, more hair. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyways, he's the voice. So I don't know where you want me to start yeah, on the well, story. Uh, just to pick it up from the beginning there. Um, uh, so the pilot slumps over the controls. They get, as we talked about in the first um, video on the series, he ended up in a 270 degree turn, diving turn, and then recovered the aircraft, kind of heading southbound um and then pick it up from there do you know uh, is there anything so, to so i'm kind of i'm kind of like you guys i'm still trying to put all the pieces together mm -hmm. um so i reached out to the other controller involved and i just just out of like um you know respect i said hey man uh you're i'm getting a lot of your audio but my face so i don't want to steal your your uh your spotlight mm -hmm. yeah and he just said you know don't worry about it i'm not a very um pu public guy but you know, here's here's what happened from his side. Basically, uh, shortly after um, they had lost control, there was a um, Miami Center had showed that aircraft to my facility because my my facility air traffic control, we work a pretty big airspace, and they were basically just saying, "Hey, this plane is going to get close to your airspace. Just keep an eye on it." And somewhere somewhere in that line, the plane kind of went nordo. And that that two right two seventy thing happened. Mm -hmm. And from what Darren had said, when the pilot passed out, they tried to pull him away from the controls, um, and it, it ripped the headset out of the um, the jack. Oh, okay. So so I think it was. Um, I, I assume a caravan probably has that fancier plug in, like the limo plug. Mm. I would think. I don't know for sure. I don't know what year the plane is, but uh, that's kind of what I pictured in my head. But 
he said when that happened, um, they basically weren't talking to anybody. So they had to use the co-pilot headset headset to talk. Okay. And it was a G-1000 aircraft. Okay. Um, so what everybody seemed to think is that when they departed Marsh Harbor, they were going to, uh, they were going to clear customs at Fort Pierce. Right. They had the frequency preloaded 128.2, which is Fort Pierce Tower. Okay. So they probably ended up figured out, oh, let's push the button to try to call somebody. That's the only thing we could figure because they would have been on Miami center frequency still. So when the audio that we're hearing uh, is Fort Pierce Tower, it's, correct? Yeah, so it's a controller. His name is Chip Flores. Chips, yeah, that's it's, already, it's already been released, so I can I can tell you his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, so he's a really cool guy. Uh, he probably even talked to you guys. Um, but so he picks up. At, I don't know how much um, Nordo there was, mm -hmm. but when when the Darren finally gets in in um, contact with somebody. He calls Fort Pierce Tower, and that's all the audio you're hearing. Like, hey, we don't know where we are, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So so that's when um, they start giving them instructions because Darren says, hey, the, the our pilot, we're in a serious situation. Our pilot is incoherent, and he's like, what's, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And they started thinking, oh, hypoxia. Uh, so that's why they gave them a descent instruction, even though their radar oh. – good point yeah yeah so fort pierce tower normally just looks class delta towers normally just focus on a really zoomed in area they don't look way out even though they they might have the capability of kind of scoping out and looking mm -hmm. but this this plane was probably at least 100 miles away still but they were at a higher altitude so they could still reach fort pierce tower they were somewhere near like freeport at the, at the time i think it kind of maybe just uh west of freeport bahamas mm -hmm. So, um, so they try to give them the instructions, hey, fly north or south, parallel, parallel the coast, uh, um, and we'll try to see if Palm Beach Approach Control can get a hold of you or look for you on radar. Mm -hmm. So um, so at some point, um, the videos were breaking up, and uh, Darren had tried to give him several instructions on using the transponder and all that. And, and you know that side of the story. I don't know if you want me to explain or not. Yeah, what go ahead Darren, in your words, yeah. Okay, so Darren basically tried to get him to do the ident on the G1000, right. the Squawk 7700. Um, so Darren basically had told me, and he told the Fort Pierce control, uh, Tower controller that whatever reason, if it was the uh, pilot side or co-pilot side, that the G1000 was blacked out on that side. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know how that would happen. But um, so, and then you had heard his response when he asked him, um, do you see the ident button? And he's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was good on Darren's part to kind of communicate. So, um, so now they're starting to brainstorm in the tower. And uh, there's another um, guy called, uh, I think his name is Justin Boyle. Mm -hmm. He's a supervisor there at Fort Pierce Tower. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to help brainstorm with Josh to try to figure out what we could do. Mm -hmm. So they they so they suggested contacting Palm Beach Approach on that frequency you heard. Mm -hmm. Well, they kind of messed up because it's really, that's a Miami center frequency, but regardless, the pilot couldn't change radios anyways. Yeah. He, he couldn't change frequencies because he didn't really know how to use the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so then they suggested the phone number and that's when I was watching your report the other day. I was like, and then you guys thought, well, the story kind of takes off from there because it was all done on phone and that's mm -hmm. why he didn't have it. Well, um, I talked to Josh because I wanted to know his side of the story, and I'll I'll tell you what he said. Hmm. Okay, I got it here from a a message. He says, uh, "I said I guess you guys couldn't hear the pilot side of the conversation when he was inbound to Palm Beach," and he said, "No, around the time I was trying to give him your guys' frequency, and re his responses were getting harder and harder to hear. Then I tried give him a phone number, and right after that." telling him you guys are going to talk to him on a frequency i never he never heard me say either one so um so the reason why it was because of the range he was getting too far away okay so now instead of like heading north on the shoreline or kind of parallel the shoreline he was kind of heading south and if you look at the track on flight aware and just kind of reference it to mm -hmm. where palm beach palm beach airport is he ended up kind of entering our airspace where our airspace comes in he uh, kind of like 30 miles east 
or so of Palm Beach Approach, Palm Beach International. Okay. And um, at some point, I was on break when when this was all. Well, I was probably I was probably working at one point, but then I was on break. But when I, I'll, I'll explain in a second. But um, by the time we got in radio communications, we had found him on radar. But um, he was closer down towards the Boca Raton Airport, Bravo Charlie Tango. Mm -hmm. And my um, operations supervisor was talking to him. He got in contact with him, but on Fort Pierce Tower frequency. Hmm. And I sent you a picture of the radio. It's a PET 2000 is what it's called. Yeah, I've never seen that before. It's kind of like it's like this emergency radio and you manually push in the frequency and then you key the mic like an old style like police policemen like and calling in a call mm-hmm. uh, so that's the way how it is so um so now i'm on break and they get they're getting in contact with this this pilot or the, i'm sorry the passenger darren who's flying the plane and i hear this page and it says uh bobby come to the tracon immediately mm-hmm. and we never page people like that because it's like a monday through friday you know uh, it's just not, you don't in big trouble for something. Yeah, you rattle, you rattle a lot of heads when you do that. Mm. So, so I don't waste any time. I just go in. I, I didn't know if it was a joke or what's going on, but, uh, I see people coming out of their offices also to come enter to the radar room, which the radar room doesn't have any windows. It's just a, a fairly dark room with a bunch of radar scopes. Um, so I, I get in the room and my, my supervisor, um, his name is Mark Saviglia. He's an operations supervisor. He um, he just briefed me real quick and he said, uh, here's the situation. The pilot is unconscious and there's two people on board, two passengers, and they're flying the plane. And since you're a flight instructor, we want you to try to um, talk him down to land on one of the runways. He didn't care where, he just wanted him on the ground. Hmm. So I said, oh man, that's what I'm thinking, right? <laughs> Why me? So, uh, and you got about yeah. a thousand hours as a CFI or more. Um, so, so I have 1200 hours about, um, but I, but I only, as a CFI, I've only given about a hundred dual given just from different things. Cause I do it part-time mm-hmm. and I only got it to try to keep learning. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you know, it makes you better when you, oh, when yeah. you try to teach something. Oh yeah. So, uh, so I was selected for this task. We do have a couple of pilots in the building. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the guy who was briefing me was also a pilot, but um, he used to f- he used to fly into the the storms with like C-130s and mm-hmm. stuff, the big hurricanes. But uh, he's like, you're the most current, you're your instructor, we're counting on you type of thing. Good luck. So, so now I walk over to the radar scope where they were talking to him. And normally we'd have like our earpiece in mm-hmm. and our little boom and our, our, our switch, or we can use our foot pedal to talk to the pilot. Mm-hmm. So this was different. It's this old school radio because we don't, this frequency doesn't belong to us. And the only reason it worked is because Darren, the plane was in range above and we were just using it just like you would like 122.9, you know, just you know, unicom type frequency, we're just able to relay to him by using just a random frequency. Is I, I don't really know how the radio stuff works too good, but, but Darren was able to just stay on this. He was stuck on that one frequency he, and he yeah. never had to change it. Right. So we, we, uh, what well, I guess it was my supervisor brainstorm, like we're going to talk to him on 128.2 and Darren will still, was still there, but at least Fort Power, Fort Pierce Tower couldn't hear him. Um, but they started to hear us when we, Hey, uh, three, 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 Lima Delta. How do you hear us? Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. You know? Mm-hmm. So, um, he could hear us now and I guess you could kind of keep playing that game as far as you want to go. As long as everybody's on that frequency, I don't know how that works. Hmm. I would assume that you could do that. But, um, so now I sit down at the radar scope and I'm talking to him on this radio and it's, it's above my head. And the speaker's out up there, and we have a lot of noise. It's in the Tracon from, like, different landlines and stuff. Yeah. And I and I just, like, sat down, and I said, okay, I'm talking to him now. And the briefing was, okay, last thing we gave him uh, was to send to 3,000. So he's about 5,000 feet, and he was told to descend to 3,000. And he's flying the plane. Like, he has control of the plane. He might be turning and stuff because he's like, where do I, you know, where do I go? So... I'm just kind of like staring at the radar scope for like two seconds. And I'm like, all right, well, I can't just sit here and do nothing. I got to just start talking Sorry. to him. We got to do 
do something yeah. here, boys. Yeah, so, so I'm just going to shoot from the hip here. And I said, uh, hello, sir, 333 Lima Delta, can you hear me? And he said, yes, uh, I do hear you. And um, I said, okay, we're going to try to get you to an airport. And he was closest to Boca Raton Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about a 6,000 plus foot runway, mm -hmm. a very congested area. Mm. Um, and he told me he could see the shoreline off his right side, which, you know, is the Atlantic side. Mm -hmm. uh, so Florida is really easy. It's like a grid pattern, yep. straight roads, either north and south or east or west. Um, and he was like 5,000 feet, descended to 3,000 feet. And I would say I'm kind of like just going from memory and I don't have audio, of course. But uh, I would say about maybe 30 seconds to a minute elapsed. And I said, um, OK, well, I think we're going to take you to Boca. Let me know if you see it. It's it's uh, and you naturally want to talk ATC because that's how we're taught. So I'm like, it's off your 10 o'clock and four miles. And I like, wait a minute. He's not going to understand this. Um, OK, sir, it's off your left Good. coming up. And he actually said he I believe he said he had it in sight. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, no, I don't really have a good feeling about this. I'm going to bring them to Palm Beach instead because it's a big runway. So I said, okay, um, something to the fact like change, change of plans. We're going to bring you to Palm Beach International. It's a bigger runway. You'll have a better chance, 10,000 foot runway. Um, what I want you to do is just start a shallow turn to the right. And I, I, I think I made the mistake again. I said, uh, fly heading 360. And I was like, I don't know if he's going to know what that means. Mm -hmm. But I said, um, I want you to keep the shoreline off your right wing. And I just want you to point the nose of the aircraft north. And I don't know how from he does live in Florida his whole life in Lakeland is what he told me. But uh, I-95 is right there. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good visual reference. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think of suggesting that to tell him, mm -hmm. but the shoreline's just as good. So I did say, just keep the shoreline off your right wing and I'm gonna like point out the airport as you get closer. So um, now I had him about 3000 feet heading on a northerly heading. Mm -hmm. And uh, one problem with our airport at Palm Beach International is uh, about seven miles Southwest of the airport, there's some really tall TV antennas. Mm -hmm. They go up to about 15, 1550 yep. MSL. So I was kind of nervous to get him too low Good. near those antennas. Mm -hmm. So I kept him around 2,000 feet and in a pretty good distance east of those antennas. Mm -hmm. And then I started, well, he's on about a four-mile right base for runway one zero left. And the winds were out of, like, the northeasterly. They were pretty strong that day. Mm -hmm. um, but I was scared to let him just go in on a right base descending out of like 2000 and not be stable. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I said, Hey, I'm going to bring you across the final. You're going to see Palm beach, but we're not going there yet. I'm going to bring you across the final and give you more time to get set up. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so I brought him across the final for one zero left. He was around 2000 feet. And then um, I told him, I'm just going to give you more time to get set up and get slowed down and and he along the way he told me like hey um i don't know how to stop the plane i don't know how to use the brakes um do you know how to turn the the screen back on all i have is altitude and uh i came back and i said okay don't worry about it i can see your ground speed i can see your your heading pretty much and i got your altitude just keep it so, simple man yeah so i i don't know after thinking about it for a while, I don't know if he was having to look down at the three instruments that are typically on your backup, mm -hmm. like your analog gauges. Yep. He might have been having to look down to reference that. But when I did ask him about airspeed, I said, hey, do you have any airspeed indications? And he said, no. And then I heard the other passenger say something like I could hear his voice, but I couldn't hear clearly what it was. And he said, uh, and then Darren came back and said, yes, yes, I guess we do have airspeed. So they might have been looking at the the small, you know, um, pedostatic airspeed indicator below. Mm -hmm. They should have a round standby. Right. Yeah, they have the uh, the three primary gauges there. Mm -hmm. So um, I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> so so I get them across the final. It's looking good, and you can see it really good on on flight aware if you play it. Mm -hmm. um, because you're looking at his ground speed, and you're comfortable 
with the way he's handling the airplane? Yeah, yeah. I was I was starting to get more confident as he's taking my instructions. You know, sometimes when a pilot, even a pilot, you can tell he's struggling because he's not responding to you anymore. He's just mm -hmm. flying and he's kind of blocking you out. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that before too. So, I mean, he was able to uh, maintain control of the airplane, listen to my instructions. You know, it's kind of like remarkable. <laughs> and then pretty much follow him. Like sometimes I would have to, you know, hey, just continue descending because maybe I didn't see a descent. But as long as I kept talking to him, that was my big thing after listening to so many different accident videos on YouTube and stuff. Like you hear them say like, hey, just keep talking to me. You know, are you still there? Uh, See, so I wanted to kind of make him feel comfortable. Yes. And he, he was already pretty calm, but maybe a little nervous. So, so now um i believe he was like kind of tracking more northwesterly and i told him what we were going to do i was going to bring him back in for landing i was just going to bring him on a longer final and he he prompted me like hey what about flaps do uh -huh. we need flaps uh -huh. so i said we can do flaps if you you know we can do flaps so i said um i was like oh my i forgot to mention my um operations supervisor had requested that the manager bring in two pieces of paper. One was a glass cockpit and one was an analog uh, cockpit, just so I could kind of reference them to see what he might be looking at. Cause I don't, I don't fly a, I don't fly a caravan. caravan. So you're looking at a picture of the cockpit. The yeah. Just like a regular sheet of paper mm -hmm. uh, color. Mm -hmm. And as best as the, the most thing that it helped me with was I could see the throttle quadrant, mm -hmm. at least kind of tell what he was. I couldn't see all the stuff, but I could tell like where the throttle was. So um, I could see also see the flaps and I could see the color indicators and I could tell it was pretty similar to almost like a Skyhawk. Mm -hmm. You have different yeah. airspeed printed on there. So I didn't really care too much about exceeding the flap speed. Yeah. And so I, I told him, I said, okay, we can try the, like the first notch of flaps, but when you put it down, you're gonna maybe feel the plane balloon up. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at my diagram and I said, you're gonna wanna push forward with the control wheel and roll roll the trim. Do you see the trim wheel? And I told him that, I don't know if he ever got that down or not, but I didn't see much altitude change. Mm -hmm. But I noticed when he did it, um, and I told him you can relieve the pressure by rolling the control wheel forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed his, what we call PTL line, but basically his track of his aircraft started kind of zigzagging. So almost like when somebody's like following the ILS and overcorrecting. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, hey, uh, the plane's kind of unstable or, or flying kind of weird. Can we just not do flaps? Mm -hmm. And I said, that's fine. We don't need them. Just raise them back up. And when he did that, and I don't, it could have been because of the speed of the aircraft. Yeah. I'm not sure. Oh. Um, so, so we raised them back up and then everything was back to normal. Good. So then I started coaching him on the, the throttle. I said, okay, the whole time I was showing him like 160 knots ground speed. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want you to start to slow down a little bit for me. Not too much. And I said something like airspeed, your friend, mm -hmm. uh, I want you to just pull that throttle back just a little bit towards you. And then about a minute or two later, I started to see the airspeed go down to like 130. And I was like, all right, well, I feel like we're getting somewhere. So I started to feel even more confident. So th this whole time he's kind of flying away from the airport. And I, I said, all right, uh, I want you, we're going to try to bring you back in now. So I want you to make a, a shallow turn to the left. And he just kind of started making like, I guess it would almost been like a, a left 270 and just real shallow and i had him down to like 2000 he might have dropped down to like 1800 1700 a couple times mm -hmm. um but but by the time he was about on a, like an eight mile final he was around 2000 again and i think i had told him to start a descent to like what i was thinking is pattern altitude so about a thousand mm -hmm. so as he's coming in from like an eight mile final to about a four mile final i would say he was probably below the glide slope mm -hmm. You know, if you were figuring like a three degree glide slope, um, but about a three mile, three to four mile final, he was kind of right on it again. So I, I always used a uh, 300 feet per mile type of yep. thing. Three to so one. I, I use that because I do instrument instruction too. And I always find that's helpful. Mm -hmm. So I was just looking at that and he just kept saying, Hey, um, 
how's my altitude look? How's my altitude look? So I just kind of gave them altitude readouts all the way down final, almost like an ASR approach. Mm -hmm. So I just said, you know, you're, you're six miles, you're at this altitude, you're at four miles, you're at this altitude, you're looking great. Uh, your speed was good, maybe like 130. Um, I, I did instruct him on, he asked about the brakes again. I said, all I want you to do is when you get on the runway, just your rudder pedals at the top of those pedals is going to be your brakes. Mm -hmm. and I, I assumed it was, I had flown a, yeah, exactly. I have, I had flown a uh, Kodiak before and it was no different than the Skyhawk as far as brakes are concerned. Mm -hmm. I've flown a Phenom once with a friend and the brakes were the same. So I figured it had to be the same. <laughs> and, and then I told him, I kind of went on a limb here, but I, I told him, Hey, I don't ever want you to get slower than 110. And I just picked a ballpark speed that I thought was safe mm -hmm. from my experience watching planes come in on the radar for the last 20 years. Good. Good. So um, I just said no slower than 110. And I, the slowest I ever remember seeing him was like 130. But when I went back and watched it, I think it did actually show 120, but he also had a heck of a headwind. Or I would say like a kind of like a crosswind. Oh, wow. Uh, this so, whole time, by the way, when he made that 270, did he say he had the runway in sight? So so I asked him as he's passing the airport if he saw it. And I don't know. Once again, I don't know if he was in the the co the co-pilot side. Uh, if he was on the co-pilot side, he would have saw it really good because it would have been off his right wing. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting right there as he was flying north. Um, but he said he did see it then. And then when I figured, all right, well, he got a really good look at it then. And then as he was about, say, five or six miles northwest of the field, and I told him to start a shallow turn, as I'm just kind of brainstorming stuff, he's just kind of keeping himself in that turn, almost like, boom, he knew where it was, and he lined himself up perfectly, almost like he turned himself onto the ILS. Hmm, yeah. So so I was like, this is great. <laughs> so, uh, so on final – um, you know, all the way down the final, I would say I went back and looked at the radar data today again, and uh, he looked really good at like a three mile final. He was pretty much on the glide slope coming down. Um, if anything, like 130 knots, so slightly fast, but I, I knew he was going to land flat and I knew he was going to be fast because of the no flaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and then same thing, two mile final, one mile final, it all looked good with speeds and altitudes. And then since our radar, you know, radars are kind of pointed up, I guess, mm -hmm. and his proximity to the airport, around 300 feet, his data block just dropped just off my scares. scope. Mm -hmm. So um, so I had told him at some point earlier, I believe, and as he got in closer, I said, hey, typically the runway looks narrow, but as you get closer, it's going to get wider. And as it gets wider, that's when you can start bringing your power back slowly and then start to pull the control wheel back to you to to get the landing in. Mm -hmm. um, so around 300 feet, I'm like, oh great, you know, I'm not, and I'm, am I still talking to him? Is he still there? I don't know what happened. So I just say, hey, are you still there? He's, I'm still here. I said, whew. No, he's, so, he's, right? he's calming yeah. you down now. <laughs> yeah, because I can't. I mean, ultimately, if I could have been in the control tower where a lot of my colleagues were just up there, but they had to deal with the emergency crews and stuff and move planes away from that taxiways adjacent to the runways, mm -hmm. they wanted a little buffer. So they up they were up there to witness it all on the landing and stuff. Um, but I was in just the dark room with the scopes. So um, I just said, hey, are you still there? And I just reminded him again. He said, yes, I am. I said, okay, just remember you know, the runway is going to be narrow, but then it's going to get bigger and then just pull your power back and start pulling the control back to you. And they, and then they had said, um, he, he looked like he was coming in a little high and a little hot. Um, but they pretty much, uh, about, I'd say five seconds to 10 seconds go by. And he said, I'm on the runway. How do I stop this thing? And I was like, whoo, yeah, I was like, thank God. Wow. Um, wow. What so, a story. Yeah. So then um, I just reminded him, hey, put your put your feet at the top of the pedals and just apply pressure with your toes. And he got it stopped about, I'd say about halfway down the runway. And kind of just a beam where the terminal would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, Do you want it? Was, I thought I was cracking up, but I, I didn't do it. I was like, he's like, Do you want me to turn it off the taxiway? 
or to get on the, get off the runway. I said, just, just stop. The, the fire department is going to come up to you. Yep. And then uh, he said, how do I shut it off? And I was like, well, I don't know. I've never shut it off before. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I remember the Kodiak, we had to pull like the fuel back and stuff, almost like pulling the mixture. Yep. So my my uh, supervisor who flew like C-130s, he's just, just telling him to pull all the levers back. So I was like, I'm looking at my diagram. I was like, just pull all the levers back. <laughs> so, so then um, shortly after that, he was gone. He, like the, the fire department, the airport ops all came up to him. Um, but but the people on the control tower that I work with, they said he he looked like he landed like a carrier landing, a little bit of bounce. But he, I flew um, after I left that day. I went and did a short flight at another airport with a friend, mm -hmm. and it was we got good crosswind practice that day. Wow. It was it was pretty strong gusty winds. Wow. Hmm. Sometimes the buildings help block them some, mm -hmm. but um, I, I forgot to mention too. Um, about probably like a five mile final, four mile final. I just brainstormed. I was like, hey, do you have wheels or floats? I just thought of it because of the caravan. Ooh, good idea. And he said, uh, we're on wheels. I said, okay. Good. And come come to find out, I asked Darren when he came to visit and he said, cause I saw a picture I Googled of that same plane was on floats. And he yep. said three weeks before they had taken the floats off. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, he lands the aircraft, he gets it stopped, fire and rescue, take him off. And then about an hour and a half later, you guys meet up? Yeah, so he wanted to uh, come over and meet us and, and, you know, thank us. I think he said something to the fact, like, Where, where's the controller or something? <laughs> but uh, we met him out. We have, like, you probably saw the picture, but um, we have, like, right in front of the tower at the base of the building. It's like a flagpole. So it's a really good, nice place to take a picture. Yeah, we got it right here. Uh, uh -huh. With some palm trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just shake hands, kind of give each other, like, a big hug. And I'm like, I never met you before, but i got to hug you now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, when, it was like, uh, you know, not like what you're going to cry, but, you, like, your eyes are teary. Yeah. Just, like, some emotion. But he was, man, he was calm. I was, like, I was really surprised to see, like, like he wasn't more shaken up. And I asked him, I, was, I said, hey, um, you have a ride home and stuff. And he just said, yeah, I rented a car already. I'm going to drive home, which is, it's about a, probably like a two and a half hour to two and a half to three hour drive home from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, we offered him, after we took a couple pictures, uh, we offered him a tour of the building. So we brought him up to the control tower. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we brought him up to the down to back stairs to see the radar room where I kind of worked him in. Good. And he's like, he couldn't believe that, you know, that's where you work me from. And he probably has never seen a radar scope before, too, because <laughs> most people are like, what are you guys? How do you do that with these things? Just a little green dot out there. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Huh. But, um, he didn't seem to, uh, you know. He didn't like that one of the controllers asked to video him, but he didn't mind pictures. Okay. So, so we don't have any video. <laughs> uh, yeah. Private guy. Wow. What an amazing story. Huh? And so he said, you asked him if you want to become a pilot. He said, no way. I yeah. He, he said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> too much, too much work. And then uh, what about you? You mentioned in one of the stories, are you going to stay with ATC? You're going to, for career, yeah. I would advise you stay with ATC. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I went to Ember Riddle a long time ago to become an airline pilot. And then I met one of my friends I met who was out of, out of the country, who came to Ember Riddle to get his pilot license and stuff. But uh, he suggested ATC. So I, I finished my airline pilot degree, but then I also did ATC minor. Good. Uh, well, well, shortly after... Um, I graduated, I was going to try to get a job in any one I could do first. And that was back in like 2001. Mm -hmm. And then right after I graduated, 9-11 happened. And that kind of killed all the low time pilot yep. in airline job thing. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just do whatever job I can do until I hear something. And short, not not too long after I, I got an ATC gig, which with the FAA. So I've been doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. And then I had a... Um, a pretty big break in flying probably like 10 or 12 years and then my father-in-law decided to buy an air buy an airplane mm -hmm. so um we ended up uh flying that and then as i started getting back into aviation more consistently i was like man i need i need some kind of way to pay for this 
So I was like, what if I got, uh, or make it cheaper at least. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, Hey, I kind of like study a lot and kind of refresh my memory and stay in it. When I become an instructor. So I just kind of do it on the side to, you know, keep stuff fresh and also kind of help. If I want to go flying for fun, it kind of pays for it. Excellent. Good, good. And then, uh, but you're going to stick with the, for the rest of your career, you're going to stick with ATC. Oh, are you going to go into flying more? Or what so, um, with the FAA, uh, as far as working as a controller on the boards, you, you have to retire at 56. I'm 47. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of doing it for just to get my retirement another couple of years mm -hmm. and then maybe cross over into flying a little bit. But um, I kind of like being home. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. I wouldn't mind doing um, like a flying gig where you can just, you know, fly for the day and come back home every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be cool to see some of the different places, but I got a, I got a family, I got a wife yep. and I, it's nice to be home every day. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't mind doing some kind of flying, uh, maybe just not where you're gone all the time. Yeah. Yep. It's a, you could be a long way from home. I was. Yeah. I've seen your videos. <laughs> <laughs> thousands of miles away just yesterday um, yeah <laughs> wow well that answers i think most all of my questions on here yeah i just when i noticed you you guys had like where you thought we talked to him on the phone i just wanted to get you the rest of the story and Clarify hopefully that. um hopefully darren's interview on monday i believe hopefully that'll kind of kind of um you know tell tell the full story where if i got anything wrong because i told him um, he had texted me once about, you know, maybe not having all the information correct. And I just had specifically, you know, what did I get wrong? But he didn't really give me any answers. But I said, hey, I'm I'm trying to keep this story true as much as I remember. Um, so and then, you know, sometimes when you're doing interviews with the news people, they kind of pull you into some questions or or edit stuff to where it makes it sound like you're saying something different. Mm -hmm. uh, I've learned a little bit from doing a lot of interviews, Good. but. But this is a cool one because I've watched your channel before I ever had this happen to me. <laughs> well, this is so cool to have you on board here. And we just tell the whole story all the way through with all the technical detail and take as much time as we want to, to cover it. Just, just fantastic. And it's opened my eyes a lot too. I mean, you guys were both learning together uh, how to, yeah. how to do, deal with this situation. Yeah, most people um, can't believe it. Um, and we did, you might not know, but they did scramble the fighters out of uh, Homestead because when the, when the aircraft di diverted from its IFR flight plan and kind of just went Nordo, mm. uh, they started to think like it was uh, some kind of like terrorist type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So while he was on the way in the Palm Beach, um, they did have some fighters up circling uh, kind of like a few thousand feet above them just to kind of keep an eye. Yeah, uh, I believe they were F-15s. That's, um, see, they're coming in through a thing called the ADIS, the Air Defense Identification Zone. And the whole mission of these reserve guys or guard guys in Homestead with the F-15s is to protect the ADIS. And anytime somebody penetrates the ADIS without proper notification, they're automatically scrambled. They're sitting there alert. That's their whole job is to sit there and deal with situations like this. Yeah. And, uh, and it worked. Huh. Wow. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think th to think that those guys would be up there, but they are. They, they yeah, we had them um, previous before we've had them break the sound barrier when we had a lot of the TFR stuff going on uh, with um, when Trump was in there, er, when Trump was there a lot, just the random stuff, people's transponders not working, though. Mm. They, they shoot up. <laughs> they go stumbling in. You go stumbling into a TFR and these guys respond and they're going to respond at the speed of heat. And that means <laughs> they're going to break the sound barrier where they really technically shouldn't be. But they're responding to kind of an emergency situation. Wow. Very, very interesting. Excellent. Well, do keep in touch, Robert. And uh, there you yeah, go, you. Um, I'll send you some photos of... Uh, some that I got today. I don't uh, anything for the channel or whatever, but uh, you know, I'm just trying to keep the story true and yep. and also recognize the the guy in Fort Pierce because, um, you know, I thought he did a great job. I I don't know if he's a pilot or not. I told him I want to meet him soon. Mm -hmm. He's probably about 50 miles away from my facility, but his we are my facility 
basically handles the approach control in a, his facility. Mm -hmm. So we talk to each other on landlines and stuff. And all the time together. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And if Chip wants to uh, jump in here too and join the conversation, he's more than welcome to uh, help us connect there if you could there, Robert. And Yeah. And, uh, we'll get his side of the story too. Okay, great. Excellent. All right. Awesome. I, I hope I meet you someday at Sun and Fun or something. Yeah, yeah. That's a good, that's a good show there. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks so much for filling us in on the, that whole side of the story. Robert Morgan, the ATC controller that, uh, that uh, safely brought down the Cessna caravan with the passenger pilot. Thanks, Juan. All right. Thanks for everything you do with the channel. All right. We'll see you here. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.